Okay, this is a shorter exposition on action. This is about karma. Thus have I heard on one occasion the Blessed One was living at Sawati in Jetta's Grove, Amith and Pindika's Park. When a young Brahmin student, Sabha, Todiya's son, went to the Blessed One and exchanged greetings with him. Now Sabha, he was only 15 or 16 years old when he went to the Buddha, and he would ask questions, but he had a very, very intelligent mind. So he could ask questions directly to the Buddha, and the Buddha would treat him like he was an elder. Okay. When this courteous and amiable talk was finished, he sat down at one side and asked the Blessed One, Master Gotama, what is the cause and condition why human beings are seen to be inferior and superior? For people are seen to be short-lived and long-lived, sickly and healthy, ugly and beautiful, uninfluential and influential, poor and wealthy, low-born and high-born, stupid and wise. What is the cause and condition, Master Gotama, why human beings are seen to be this way? Student, beings are owner of their actions heirs of their actions, they originate from their actions, are bound to their actions, have their actions as their refuge. It is action that distinguishes beings as inferior or superior. I do not understand in detail the meaning of Master Gotama's statement, which he spoke in brief without expounding the meaning in detail. It would be good if Master Gotama would teach me the Dhamma, so I might understand in detail the meaning of Master Gotama's statement. Then, student, listen and attend closely to what I shall say. Yes, sir. The Brahmin student Sabha replied, The Buddha said this, Here, student, some man or woman kills living beings and is murder murderous, bloody-handed, given to blows and violence, merciless to living beings. Because of performing and undertaking such action, on the dissolution of the body after death, he reappears in a state of deprivation, in an unhappy destination, in perdition, even in hell. But if on the dissolution of the body after death he does not reappear in a state of deprivation, but instead comes back to the human state then, wherever he is reborn, he is short-lived. This is the way, student, that leads to short life. Namely, one kills living beings and is murderous, bloody-handed, given to blows and violence, merciless to living beings. So, a person that practices um, being a butcher, they generally are not very healthy people, and they generally do not live very long. But it's kind of an interesting thing, because sometimes women can have a baby, and the baby only lives for a very short time, and then dies. And they, they wonder, why, why, why? It's not the woman's fault that the baby died very young. It's that being. In their past life, they, they killed other beings. So they didn't live very long. 
So, one of the things that I've, I've taught people for a long time is that when you practice the meditation, it's good to practice your generosity. And when you practice your generosity, there are different kinds of generosity that you can practice. One of the things that is very good to do is to go out and buy some animal that is going to be killed, like lobster or crab or fish or chickens, and they're still alive. And then you take them and you let them go free. When you let them go free, your mind becomes very happy. Now, giving life is a very, very important gift to give. I know people that are very sick and they practice giving and giving life and letting go of uh, worrying about their sickness. When they let that, that animal go free, they let go of the worry. Their body becomes healthy again. So when you practice giving life, it's one of the most powerful gifts that you can give. Now, the animals, uh, let's say the lobsters or crabs, they're in a restaurant and people go up and they say, I want that one or I want that one. And then somebody takes and kills them and, and prepares the, the meat. When you ask for this one or that one, you are taking part in that being's death. And that is bad karma for you. But if you say, I want this one, but I want you to keep him alive. I want to take him home. And then you let him go free. What is happening in that lobster's mind? The lobster knows that it's caught. The lobster knows that it's going to be killed. Why? Because he sees other lobsters being put in the same thing and they get taken away. And they're killed and they know that. So the lobster has a lot of fear and is very much afraid. And then somebody comes in and they grab them. Oh, they're very, very sad. And then they come out and you let, they, he's not killed right away, but he still has fear of death. Then you take that lob lobster out to the ocean and you let that lobster go back in the ocean. What have you done? That lobster has gone from the worst day in their life. They knew they were going to be killed. They had a lot of fear. They had a lot of anxiety. And now you let them go free. They went from the worst day in their life to the best day. Now they can continue living. All beings want to continue living. So when you let them go free. In your mind you say, I let go of worry, I let go of pain, I let go of whatever it is that you have an attachment to. Uh, fear of death. I know some people that, that uh, have cancer and they want to let go of the cancer so it does they want to be healthy. They don't want to die. So they let these animals go and let go of the worry about the cancer. And the merit that they make for giving life comes back to them. Now there was one lady in Malaysia, I told this story a couple days ago, that she, she came to me and she told me that she was going to die in about one month. 
The doctor said the cancer, there was nothing they could do. The cancer was so bad that she was going to die. And she asked what she could do so that she could be happy for that one month. So I told her to buy an animal, let it go free, and focus on happiness coming into her mind. She went out to the fishing boats, and they have little fish that they use as bait. She bought 100 fish, and she, then she would take it out and let it go free in the ocean. And she became very happy. She did this every day. After about six weeks, she went to the doctor because she felt good. She didn't feel sick. And the doctor examined her. And the doctor said, what have you been doing? What kind of medicine are you taking? I want to know about this. And she said, I quit taking medicine. I went down and I bought fish and I let them go free. Every day. That's all I've done different. She didn't have any cancer. The cancer went away. The gift of life is very, very powerful. Anything that you're very much worried about you buy some animals that are going to be killed, let them go free. And let go of that worry. And then everything starts working so that you don't have that worry come up anymore. So this is a very good thing to do. I have a question. Yes. The animal at the pound, why can you let them go? Why dog and cat? You uh, can't let them go free. Well, you don't them. buy those kind of, unless you take them home for your, and take care of them yourself. Now, there's, there's one lady that I give retreat at Joshua Tree <coughs> in, in California every year. And she goes to the pound, and she finds animals that are, they're going to be killed. And she brings them home with her. And she loves them, and she gives them food and then they die naturally. So that, that's one, one way of doing it. Or you, you get lobster, you get crabs, you know, you have to buy them alive, and then you take them out to the ocean and let them go. In the pet stores they feed mice to the snakes. And you can take you can take the mice and you can let them go in the forest, but not close to your house. <laughs> <laughs> you have little black and white mice running around the house. Then. <laughs> I want to buy birds, but sometimes I think you know some of these birds are, are never been out in the wild, and I'm afraid they won't make it. The buy birds, but what you do is you keep them in the cage, and you show you you show them where you're putting food. And then you feed them, and you put some in this place. And then you let the bird go free, and you keep putting food there. And they, they're smart. They'll stay around. They'll stay around. Okay. So you can do it that way. Or if you want to buy a snake, you can buy a snake, but let the snake go a, lo a long way into the forest, where there's not a lot of people. They know how to take care of themselves. When I w yeah. But only for animals that are going, to, that are going to be killed. Right. Yeah. So not go to a pet store, buy a snake, and let's free. Well, right. Um, you made me forget what I was going to say. I used to buy the eel and take them and put them back in the rice paddy. I used to do that. I would like the eels. I don't like them to kill the eels. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> In Burma, there was a monk that he walked around every, every day in the morning to get food. 
and this one water buffalo saw him. And the farmer that owned the water buffalo was going to have that water buffalo butchered. Now the water buffalo was pregnant and had a baby. The night before the water buffalo was going to be killed, it sent a very, very strong thought to this monk and said, I, I'm very much afraid that I'm going to be killed. When I'm, I'm killed, my baby will die too. I don't want my baby to die. So the next morning, the monk went around and he found out who was going to kill the water buffalo and said, please wait. And he went around to all the villagers and he collected money. However much money this farmer was going to sell the cow for. And gave it to the, the water buffalo. And then he let the water buffalo go into the forest and, and go live. And the water buffalo was so thankful that he came up to the monk and he, he got, she got down on her knees and bowed to the monk. And there's pictures of it. <laughs> so that monk, he saved two lives that day. A wonderful gift. Anyway, but here, student, some men abandoning the killing of living beings, abstains from killing beings with rod and weapon laid aside. Gentle and kindly, he abides compassionate to all living beings. Because of performing and undertaking such action, on the dissolution of the body after death, he reappears in a happy destination, even in a heavenly world. But if after the, after the body dies, he does not reappear in a happy destination, but instead comes back to the human state, then wherever he is reborn, he has long life. This is the way, student, that leads to long life, namely abandoning the killing of living beings. One abstains from killing living beings. With rod and weapon laid aside, gentle and kindly, one abides compassionate to all living beings. So if you want to have long life, practice giving life, not taking life. Here, student, some man is given to injuring beings with a hand, with a clod, with a stick, with a knife. Because of performing and undertaking such action on the dissolution of the body after death, he reappears in a state of deprivation. But if instead he comes back to the human state, then wherever he is reborn, he is sickly. This is the way, student, that leads to sickliness. Namely, one is giving to injuring beings with a hand, with a clod, with a stick, with a knife. So, Quite often you'll see that butchers, they do not live very long. And as odd as it sounds, there's a lot of doctors that do not live very long. Mm -hmm. Because they, they cut people. Okay, they're doing it with good intention, hopefully. But still, you don't see many doctors that are 80, 90, 100 years old. They die when they're 50, 60, 70 years old. But here, student, some man or woman is not given to injuring beings with a hand, with a clod, with a stick, or with a knife. 
because of performing and undertaking such action on the dissolution of the body after death, he reappears in a happy, happy destination. But if instead he comes back to the human state, then whenever he, wherever he is reborn, he is healthy. This is a way, student, that leads to health. Namely, one is not given to injuring beings with the hand, with the clod, with the stick, or with a knife. So you don't cause pain to other, other beings. And you stay more healthy. So, As you practice being more and more compassionate and kind, not only to human beings or big animals, but also small beings, insects, mosquitoes. What do you do when a mosquito bites you? And you don't even think about it. But that leads to a body that is not very healthy. So you, you don't kill the mosquitoes. A mosquito lands on you, you blow it away. I used to live in Thailand. I lived by a uh, wasp nest. And this kind of wasp is very, very deadly. If you get stung by six or seven of these at the same time, you die. And I lived right beside it. And I had to walk by every day. I go out, get food. I have to walk by the nest. The wasp comes down. They start hovering around me. The first day I saw the wasp and I thought, ah, this is my test. So I said, hello friend, how are you? I hope you're having a nice day. And they left me alone. People that came to visit me, they would run into my, into my hut because a wasp would be after them and try to sting them. I never got stung. Because I wasn't afraid of the wasp. I didn't try to run away. But I practiced loving kindness. I wish that wasp a good day, a happy day. And he would be there for a little while, and then he would fly away. And I'd go out, and then I'd come back. <coughs> I have all this food. And then he would come back again. So i say, well, this has been a good day. I hope it's a good day for you. And then he'd fly away again. I never got stung. Many people that came to see me did. Because they didn't like the wasp. They tried to hit them and make them go away. That made them angry. What is your advice? Last I remember last summer we had a, 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 a bee nest in front of our house, right in the door, the entrance. So I, mean, I can certainly not go in there and tell them you have a good day. But <laughs> if guests come into the house and it's like in the house, so what, what? Well, you can you can do a couple of things. Uh, you can hire someone that takes care of bees, and they will come with a big box and put over and they will take it away. You mean not the, the not the, the, um, the, the guy that took me, the... No, no, no. Humane no. Society. Then they can recommend you. Yeah. Well, they can humane society. There, there are people that they raise bees. Yeah. And what they, they like it. Oh, because <laughs> they get the honey. Yeah, that's the honey. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they know how to handle without harming. So that's, that's what you do. Okay. Now, if you have uh, cockroaches, mm -hmm. so many people, oh, I hate cockroaches and kill. Mm -hmm. If you want cockroaches to leave you, then you take cucumber, cut up very small, put in a dish where the cockroaches are, they leave. They don't like the smell. What you don't mice? have to kill. What about mice? Well, you can have an understanding with mice. 
You can tell them that you don't want them to come around. How do you do that? You speak to them. Forget a cat. <laughs> <laughs> I can't speak to them. But you can, you, what you can do if your friend has a cat, you take some of the fur yeah. and put it around. And they make, they go away. You can borrow our cat for a day. Unless you'll take care of it. But they're, they're smart enough to understand, and they know that the scent of a cat, that's, <laughs> uh, they need to stay away from it. And they will go away. With rats, as odd as it sounds, is you write them a letter. What? Yeah, they read. <laughs> they do. I've done this more than one time. I write them a letter telling them that it's not good that they are here. And if they stay here, I'm going to have to hurt them. Please move away. And they put it on the floor. One day, they leave. <laughs> it's a miracle. <laughs> well, not really. It does work. It really does. <laughs> See, I there, there's they, a. They read the the letter. Yeah, they do. You're thinking maybe the some kind of. Well, but they read the letter. Rats are smart. Rats read. They do. They do. Mice are not as smart as rats, but mice you can get things across to them different ways. But rats. <laughs> <laughs> If you have ants around your house, you want to get rid of the ants, you take water, cayenne pepper, put in the water, spray. Ants go away. Oh, I know one for ants too. Copper. They don't like to cross copper. Mm -hmm. So if you can use your sense. Right? It's copper. Use your what? Yeah, little pennies. Oh, yeah. What we have in the Northwest is a lot of slug. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. I, I, I love gardening and just I began to, to learn and practice Buddha teaching. So last year I ended up not growing any vegetable because I don't want to kill the, the Well, but you snail. can pick them up and move them. I tried that, but it, they just only, they only came out in, at night when <laughs> It's dark and noise and no one well, If you put cayenne pepper around your plants, mm -hmm. now you just, just sprinkle it around so you can see the red pepper. They will leave that alone. Oh, it's red pepper. Mm. No, they don't like that. You know how you, you take red peppers yeah. And if you don't have rubber gloves, how it hurts? Yeah, the crust. The crust. Well, it hurts them too. Or it chili doesn't powder. kill them. Huh? Chili powder. Chili powder works. But the rain washes it away. You well, it. you have to keep yeah. doing it. But it will start to get into the soil a little bit, and then that, they'll stay away. How do you keep the neighbor dog from the toilet thing in your yard? <laughs> I tried pepper and it didn't work. Write a paper. <laughs> write a letter. <laughs> write, write a letter to the neighbor and tell them. <laughs> Some neighbor don't control the pet. <laughs> well, then. Or some, you know, some dog could just. You know, you don't know what they call One of the things that we used to do so that the dogs would not come in onto the lawn was we take a plastic bottle that's clear, fill it with water, and put it on the lawn. Why that works, I don't know. But they, they, they left, they never came in our yard. I don't know if that will work. We, we did it one time, it did work. But I don't know if it works every time or not. So, but it's worth a try. Try mm -hmm. the auntie. How do I get an elephant to eat out my hand? <laughs> Give them peanuts. 
So if you want to stay healthy, you don't kill animals on purpose. Now there are times when you're walking and you don't see and you step on an ant. That is not intentional. So there's no bad, uh, no harm. In order to kill, there has to be five things. There has to be a living being. You have to have the intention to kill. You need a weapon, you use the weapon, and the being dies. Okay? If one of those five things isn't present, then there is no bad karma, there's no wrongdoing. So, you're walking and you don't notice a line of ants and you step on the, on the ants. You didn't do that with intention to kill. So there is no wrongdoing. I just have a question, but if you were still going to... Go ahead. What about when people um, kill an animal out of because the animal is suffering? No. No? No. No killing at that point? No. Mm -hmm. Why would you kill an animal if it's suffering? I just think of like a, a cow that's wrapped up in the barbed wire and there's no chance of him to get out and it's just in so much pain and then people shoot it. And that seems like a nicer thing to do than to let it die for like four hours or half a long time. That's that being's karma. Mm. And now you're interfering with the karma and creating bad karma for yourself. Mm. I really do not go along with taking, oh, my little cat or my dog is so sick, I'm going to take it to the veterinarian and they're going to kill it for me. I don't go along with that. Every being wants to live as long as it possibly can, even when it's suffering. Human beings are like that, right? Yeah, I, I don't want to get off, off of the subject here, okay. yeah, but um, let's talk about the, the, the living will. You know, you, if, I, if I have to depend on a um, machine to live to stand my life, and if I tell my husband or my whoever to... That, I... I is that a suicidal? No, that's not. Okay. That's letting nature take its course. But if, if, if the machine helped me to live, and then I tell someone else to unplug that machine so that I can die, and my karma, my, my karma, it's not ended, and I... Well, nice then support. if your karma is not ended when they turn off the machine, you will not die. <laughs> right? But I... The way the machines are right now, they uh, make money for the hospital and the doctors, and that's about all the good that comes from that. Mm -hmm. I do not agree with extending life in an artificial way. Mm -hmm. it's, it's only natural. We're here for a period of time and we're going to die. Why extend it for two weeks because a machine is keeping my organs going? That means I can't carry on. I can't do what, what's going to be coming next. My, um, my, my father-in-law is, is in coma right now. And my husband is there with him. And I know tomorrow I have to go and see him. And it is a very tough decision for, for, for my husband and his sister. Well, you let him know that... There is no bad karma for anyone if they take him off of that machine that's keeping him alive. And letting your father die naturally is the most humane thing you can do. I, I spent a lot of time in hospitals, I spent a lot of time in nursing homes, and I I was always trying to encourage people to let nature be nature. It's okay for people to die. 
The only reason you put them on a machine is because I want them to live longer. Mm -hmm. But they don't have any quality of life. So it's better just to let them go. So if, if, if we do that, that means we're not killing. No, that's you're not killing. Because we just honor their wish. Yes. Yeah. The law are different. Yeah. The law are different. So that's not necessarily. See, one of the things that's happened, especially in this country, is um, an awful lot of people, they are in the city so much that they don't see the real way life is. And they everybody thinks that they're young, and they're going to stay young forever, and they're going to last forever. And when you don't see the natural process of animals living and then dying, and you don't accept that, then you cause yourself a lot more pain than is necessary. So it's really better to let nature be nature. I mean, if you were in Vietnam, they don't have those kind of machines there. <coughs> People live, they die all of the time. And that's the natural way of things. And you honor that person until they die. You make them comfortable as you can. You spend time wishing <coughs> them happiness. But you allow nature to be nature. I have a question. Yes. On the subject of karma, does the person eating the meat have the same karma of the, of the butcher? No. In order to kill, there's these five things. It has to be a living being. Now, if you go to the store and you buy meat, is it alive? Did you intend to kill it? No. You didn't intend to kill it. What you intend to do is take that meat, cook it, put it in your body so that you have energy so you can continue. Did you take have a weapon? Did you use the weapon? Did the being die? No. So all five of these things that make up killing don't occur when you go to the store and you buy the meat. For you. The butcher has not got very good karma because they do, it is a living being, they intend to kill it, they take a weapon, they use the weapon, and the being dies. But you don't get any of that karma. So if I want to help the butcher and I don't eat meat, then he has no reason to kill. Do you think that eating vegetables means that beings don't die? Weren't you just talking about slugs in, a, in your vegetable they, they garden? They still die, but I, you know... Uh, well, but have. they still die. Yeah. How do they die? Someone, even if it's just their hand, that is the weapon, and they use that weapon, and the being died. You can't live in this world without beings dying because you are alive. There's 80 different kind of beings in your body that are living and dying continually. There's a story about one monk, he became an arahat, and he was walking and he saw that he was killing living beings because he was walking. So he stood in one spot. And then he noticed that by his breathing, <clears throat> he was killing living beings, so he stopped breathing. And the Buddha came along and said, Monk, what are you doing? And he told the Buddha. And the Buddha said, that is why you work to get off of the wheel of sansara. That's why you want to attain nibbana. So after this lifetime, there will be no more beings dying because of, of you having a body. 
So even though you say, well, I'm a vegetarian, there are beings that die. Just digging in the soil kills beings. So, but just keep by, so, in a way, so if you eat meat, even vegetarian, and even though you don't commit the actual act of killing yourself, but in a way you are kind of in the core conspiracy of that. No. In the rest you kill. No. You don't want to. You have no bad karma from that. I can be at the beach and I have a knife. And a man just catches a fish and he wants to use the knife to kill the fish and cut it open so he can cook it. I give him the knife, he can do whatever he wants with it. I get no bad karma from that. Right? Because I didn't intend to kill and I didn't kill. So I, I have no bad karma from that. It's an interesting, and uh, I, believe me, I have been around a lot of vegetarians that argue with me a lot. Mm -hmm. But the whole thing comes down to what are you doing with your mind in the present moment? Mm -hmm. Now, if I take a piece of meat, it's already, it's just a piece of meat. Mm -hmm. Now, this is turns into energy for my body. I can continue living. And then somebody says, well, you paid the, man, the butcher for the meat. So if you didn't pay the butcher for the meat, then that being would still be alive. But that's not true. That being is already dead. I didn't have anything to do with it. I get no bad karma from that. But it is true if everybody would keep their precepts, there wouldn't be a lot of meat eating. There's still going to be vegetable eating, and there's That's still right. going to be beings that die. I'm not, I'm not arguing. <laughs> See, <laughs> that that's the thing. Country. Having a human body <laughs> means <laughs> beings die. That's just the way it is. I thought being vegetarian, your karma is smaller than kill. Mm -hmm. you, you're pulling a vegetable out with the, the dirt is less than you killing an, an, an animal. An animal. Well, Actually, kill, there are, are a lot animal. more beings yeah. that die when you pull it out of the dirt yeah. than <coughs> if there's one cow. It's just one being. But there, when you when you disturb the soil like that, many different kinds of being die because of that. So actually, there's more beings that die from eating vegetables than from eating meat. Buddha ate vegetables. Buddha ate meat. Yeah. Well, that's not good. Was a vegetarian. But that was before he became. No. Uh, Buddha. No. He, he ate, he he ate, ate meat. Protein. He ate whatever was offered to him. He set it up so you could never say no when you held your bowl and someone put something in the bowl. You could never say to them, I'm sorry, I can't eat that. But I used to allow the monks to be vegetarian. See, right before the Buddha died, Devadatta came to the Buddha and he wanted to take over the Sangha. And the Buddha said no. So Devadatta said, well, I want you to make the rules for the monks so that they would always have to live in the forest, they could not live in the city. And the Buddha said, no. Mm -hmm. He said, I want you to make sure that all monks are vegetarian. And the Buddha said, no, I will not make those kind of rules. Uh, is that why the uh, Tibetan monks um, understand they eat meat? Too? Yeah. The, 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 the Do you know why they eat meat? Because, because they, 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 grow as a, they, they can't grow anything. Yeah. They're up so high in the mountain. They have to eat meat Rose in order to live. There's no dirt. It's a lot of rock. So who killed the meat for them? Do they go Some, buy it in the market? No, they don't buy it, but it's given to them. Offered. It's offered to them. The Theravada monks eat meat, too. Yeah, All Theravada monks eat meat, and Tibetan monks eat meat.
The only ones that really don't. Now, I've known a lot of Vietnamese monks that eat meat. I, I have. I've known a lot of them that do eat meat. And Korean monks will eat meat. But Chinese monks, no. Because they had a big religion there first, and it was all based on vegetarian setup. Right. And when Buddhism came, it was inserted into that religion. Right. So they kept a lot of that religion in place. And they just that Mahayana was going to be vegetarian. And let me also say, I've been around a lot of vegetarian uh, Vietnamese monks, too. I've been around both. Well, when you come to the center, if you're vegetarian, we don't make you eat meat. <laughs> you know, no, with, we it's whatever, whatever, we whatever kind of food you're most comfortable with, that's and what we want to make right. for you yeah, when you come to visit. If you're used to eating meat, then we'll fix a meat dish. If you're not used to eating meat, then we'll fix vegetarian for you. Do you eat meat? Yeah. I seafood? eat what? Um, some seafood. Some seafood I have allergy to. I have allergy to crab. I have allergy to uh, lobster. I have allergy to shrimp. And so if I eat it? that, I, I still accept whatever anybody gives me, but I don't eat it. Yeah. Because, and do because you eat it's like the Charabada monk, like they do not eat after 12? No, right. Yeah. yeah. That's one of the rules that the Buddha said was very good. It's good for the health. <laughs> to, I only eat one time per day. And it's good for my health. I, I don't get cold very often. I don't get sickness because I eat one time per day. The rest of the time, fast. Do you drink water or tea yeah. after that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. There are some things that I can take after, after the meal. But it's more like sweets which is not good for us anymore, <laughs> really. <laughs> but that's, I, can take, um, I can take ghee, I can take honey, uh, I can take sugar, I can take salt. Tea, coffee, juice, yeah. liquid. <laughs> Do you drink more? No. No alcohol. That's against the rules. And I know that some uh, Tibetan monks, they drink their butter beer. And that is not a good thing. Somebody, somebody <coughs> asked if I wanted to taste it. So I tasted, I took one sip. Oh. <laughs> I would never consider drinking anything like that. <laughs> it smells bad, <laughs> and it tastes bad. So you missed out on this big wine tasting day in this area? Uh, something like that. <laughs> okay. Let's see. But here, student... No, that's not it. Here, students, some man or woman is of angry and irritable character. Even when criticized a little, he is offended, becomes angry, hostile and resentful, and displays anger, hate, and bitterness. Because of performing and undertaking such action, he, reappe he reappears in a state of deprivation. But if instead he comes back to the human state, whenever he, wherever he is reborn, he is ugly. This is the way, student, that leads to ugliness. Namely, one is angry and irritable character and displays anger, hate, and bitterness. Have you ever seen somebody that's very angry and seen their face? And their face gets black. <laughs> huh. They really, they look very ugly. 
they're displaying what kind of mind there what's in their mind at that time so that's another reason that I want people to carry a mirror around with them to look at your face when you become angry and see if you want to continue on looking like that it's the fastest way to say, no, 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 I don't want to do that. I want to smile. I have a beautiful face when I smile. <laughs> but here, student, some man or woman is not an angry and irritable character. Even when criticized a lot, he is not offended, does not become angry, hostile, and resentful and does not display anger, hate, and bitterness. Because of performing such action, he reappears in a happy destination, but if instead, when he comes back to the human state, then when, wherever he is reborn, he is beautiful. That's one of the advantages of practicing loving-kindness. Now, the Buddha talked about 11 advantages for practicing loving-kindness. And one of them is that your progress in the meditation is faster with loving-kindness than any other kind of meditation. And another advantage is your face becomes very beautiful. Your face becomes radiant. So the more you can smile, the more beautiful you become. And you will notice that other people will notice that. And they will mention it to you. So that's one of the advantages of practice, or one of the advantages of practicing loving kindness. This is going on for a long time. It's not looking at me, I've been watching it. 52. Eight more minutes, okay. <laughs> Here, students, a man or woman is envious, is one who envies, resents, and begrudges the gain, honor, respect, reverence, salutation, and veneration received by others. Because of performing and undertaking such action, he reappears in a state of deprivation. But if instead he comes back to the human state, then wherever he is reborn, he is uninfluential. This is the way, student, that leads to being uninfluential. Namely, one is envious towards the gain, honor, respect, reverence, salutation, and veneration received by others. But student, here some man or woman is not envious. One does not, one who is not envious resent and begrudge the gain, honor, and respect, reverence, salutation, and veneration received by others. Because of performing and undertaking such action, he reappears in a happy destination. But if instead he comes back to the human state, then wherever he is reborn, he is influential. But haven't you ever wondered why some people, they can say something and everybody agrees with them right away. And some people can say the same thing in the same way and nobody pays attention. It's because in the past, they didn't like to see other people prosper. They didn't like to see other people get respect. So they held that hard mind. So when they're in this lifetime, they don't, they don't have much influence. They can't, they can't, even the best idea, they can't convince anyone that this is a good thing. Now, you want to change that in this lifetime, then you start giving respect to everyone. 
and you become happy when you see they have gain and they get a they get a job promotion you become happy for them ah this is wonderful you're going to be great at this and eventually after doing that for a period of time then you start to gain more influence. Other people start paying attention to what you say. But you have to be sincere. It has to be sincere. It cannot be fake. Yeah. Here, student, some man or woman is not envious. He does not envy, resent, begrudge the gain, honor, and respect, reverence, salutation, or veneration received by others. Because of performing and undertaking such action, he reappears in a happy destination. But if instead he comes back to the human state, then wherever he is reborn, he is influential the way student that leads to being influential. Namely, one is not envious towards the gain, honor, and respect given to others, or received by others. So the more you cultivate the mind that is happy when you see other people doing well, the more positive your influence will become over time. Here, student, some man or woman does not give food, drink, clothing, carriages, garlands, scents, unguents, beds, dwellings, and lamps to recluses or brahmins. Because of performing and undertaking such action, he reappears in a state of deprivation. But if instead he comes back to the human state, then wherever he is reborn, he is poor. This is the way, student, that leads to poverty, namely, one does not give food or the requisites for monks. But here, student, some man or woman gives food and the requisites to recluses or brahmins. Because of performing and undertaking such action, he reappears in a happy destination. But if he comes back to the human state, then wherever he is reborn, he is wealthy. This is the way that leads to wealth. Namely, one gives food and other requisites to the recluses or brahmins. So we know what Bill Gates did. <laughs> ah, he was generous. Very generous. And you can be generous in a lot of different ways. One of the things that the Buddha said was that if you saw the benefit of giving food, you would never eat alone. You would always share your food with someone around you. Now giving food to monks, you, there's there's a way of doing this. When you're preparing the food, you prepare with a lot of metta, with a lot of love, with a lot of kindness in your heart, and happiness. And then while you're giving the food, you give the food with a lot of metta, with a lot of love. After you have given the food and you go away, you remember giving a food with a happy mind. I really did something good. I feel happy. Being a monk, I am very used to eating food that is prepared by someone that has a happy mind. It's very, I, I can eat a little and it lasts all day. Occasionally, someone will fix food and they don't really want to. I can hardly eat that food. How do you know? You can feel the difference. 
If the food does not have love in it, one bite and it's like, oh, no, no I'll, I'll, I'll eat something else this time. I don't want that. It, it can make your stomach hurt. Can I ask a question? Yeah. My sister in California, um, she, she came to the monk and she want to offer some uh, money and food in his bowl. <coughs> and usually the monk just stand there and he just hold it on the top of the lid. And she tried to open it and offer the food and the money, money. He wouldn't let her put the, the money and the food in there. How was that? I don't know. <coughs> you would have to ask that monk. <coughs> that is not the way that the Buddha told the monks to act. Whenever someone wants to give something, I cannot refuse. I have to accept. And that was a hard lesson for me. It's very easy to give. It's very difficult to receive. But as a monk, I had to learn that I can re I, I take everything. I might not use it, but I will accept it because I want to make you happy. So whatever was going on in that monk's mind, you, you would have to ask him yeah, why he did that. He, he couldn't because he was just meditating. meditating. Well, I don't know if it's blinking. I don't know if that was really the case yeah. or he... Yeah. Uh, Anyway, I had a student that could sit for three or four hours without any problem. And I had to go to Indonesia for a couple of months. So I left and I told her I wanted to keep her practice going. The night I got back, she calls me up on the phone. And then, you know, it's, how's it going and everything? You keeping your practice going? Not really. Why? I can't sit for more than a half an hour. He said, why? I don't know. I don't want to meditate anymore. I said, no, you have to meditate. You have to meditate for an hour at least. So she kind of grumbled, and then the next day she called me up and she said, I'm really going to quit. I'm not going to meditate anymore. And I said, okay. Let's get down to brass tacks here. What precept did you break? Oh, I didn't break any precepts. I said, come on, you got to tell me. That was one there already. <laughs> and finally she said, well, yeah, actually I did break a precept. She said, I really hate ants. Now, in Asia, you can't hate ants because they're everywhere. <laughs> But she kept a real clean house, and she just got through cleaning the kitchen, and there's a row, a row of ants going. And so she very carefully swept them away and told them to go away. And she left for a few minutes and came back, and there's that row of ants again. So she went and got the ant balm, and she killed them. Ever since then, she couldn't meditate anymore. I said, okay. Now we know what the problem is. Because you took life, now you have to give life. So I told her to go buy a couple of chickens and let them go free. And uh, with the strong desire for their happiness and well-being and letting go of the guilty feeling of killing those other beings. So she had two kids. One of them was... I think one of them was six and the other one was three or something like that. So she was, she took the kids and they went and bought the chickens and now she's telling the kids about what she's going to be doing and the kids are in the back playing with the chickens and having a great time. And then she takes them out to the forest and she cuts the strings and lets them go free and she feels an immediate sense of relief. And the kids think that this is just great fun. <laughs> I said, let's do that again, Mom. This is good. Anyway, she went back to the house, and her next sitting was four hours. And she didn't have that restlessness or anxiety and all of this other stuff because of the hindrance. 
that is one of the things that you have to be more and more careful of as you go deeper into your practice, that you don't break the hindrances, because they will affect your meditation very negatively. Break the precepts. Precepts. Yeah. I need to know what those are again. Well, I will show you in a bit. So, this is some of the examples of the way that you can practice your loving kindness. And you can help beings go from the worst days in their life to the best day in their life. And some people, they say, well, I went and bought some fish, but they, they were freshwater fish, and the only place I can let them go is, is down in this pond, and there's people that are fishing there, so I feel real guilty letting them go. But that's, no, you don't feel guilty about that. That beings karma is that being's karma okay so you let the let that being go you can let the chicken go and that night a fox can come and kill it but you gave that much more life to that chicken and it was it was that being's karma to have that happen to it you let the fish go in a fresh water pond and there's people fishing. It's that being's choice either to, to go after that bait and get caught again and die or not. It's up to that being. It's not your, your problem anymore. So the more you can practice your loving kindness in all kinds of different ways and the more that you can give your happy thoughts to other people, you give your happy speech to other people, and you give your happy actions to other people, the more it will affect you in a positive way. Now, the Buddha said that when you're, when you're giving a gift, you should, there's three things that you should do. When you're giving the gift, Prepare the gift with a happy mind. While you're giving the gift, give the gift with a happy mind. After you've gone away, after you've given that gift away, reflect on that being a really good thing that you did with a happy mind. And that will lead to more and more balance in your mind. Your meditation will be much better and everything becomes easier as you practice this. So, there's uh, a lot of these fancy restaurants that they have fish f in, in the fish pond, they're in the fish uh, tank, that they will, you say, walk in and you say, I want that one, and they'll pull that one out and they'll, they'll kill it and, and give it to you for a meal. But you can buy those fish and let them go free. Or you can do with crabs or, or lobsters. But I recommend it highly. And giving, giving life is one of the highest gifts that you can give. Giving Dhamma is the highest gift. So, as you start to progress in your practice, you'll become more and more sensitive to these kind of things, and you'll start to see more and more wonderful things happening because you're focusing on positive things. A lot of times what, pe what happens with people if there are some problems in, in life, they start to become myopic. You know what that means? You don't have any, any side, side vision. You just see what's directly in front of you. <laughs> and all you see is the problem. if you start focusing on the solution instead of the problem, miracles happen. 
wonderful things happen. Things that you never would have even believed possible could happen. And after you keep going with your loving kindness and you keep practicing with it, it gets so second nature to see miracles happen that it, it's not even a shock anymore. I mean, you say, like, yeah, they... I, an example, I, I practiced loving kindness a lot when I was in Malaysia. I visited people in the hospital a lot. I went to see this one guy, somebody would come up and say, my mother just got out of surgery, she had stomach cancer, and she's still in the uh, recovery area, would you go see her? Being a monk means that I can get into a lot of places that a lot of other people can't. And this time I happened to be with uh, somebody that wanted to come with me to the hospital, so they were, they were practicing along with me. So I went in to where this, this woman was, and she has a mask on, an oxygen mask, but it's a clear one, so you can see through. So I'm standing there and I'm starting to wish her well and I close my eyes and I'm just really starting to radiate very nicely and really getting into the flow. And my student goes, wow, look at that. And I said, what are you talking about? She said, she's smiling. <laughs> she was under... And she, she was knocked out, but she was smiling. <laughs> so I said, oh, look at that. Okay, our job's done here. <laughs> so, but you get to see all kinds of really amazing things the more you focus on the loving kindness. I saw real amazing things happen with people when I was giving massage and just, I was sending the love through my hands. And I was consciously just focusing on the love, not wishing that they get well, not trying to make the energy do some particular thing. All I did was radiate loving kindness and let it go through my hands. And I saw amazing things happen. So, these kind of things, they become more and more common. It's not a surprise anymore, you know. Somebody else will see you do it and they'll go, Whoa! How did you do that? Well, it's simple. You focused on the solution, not on the problem. I had one lady that came to see me from Cape Girardeau, which is about 90 miles away. She started. She came a couple times to see me. And I started teaching her the loving kindness meditation. And then we went to Cape Girardeau and she came to see me and she said, Are you teaching magic? And I said, Well, in a way, yeah, I am teaching magic. I'm showing you the magic of letting go of thoughts and feelings that pull you down and developing an uplifted mind. And in a way, that's a kind of magic. Oh. <laughs> and she, she just couldn't believe that so many good things could happen to her, and for her, and with other people around her, when she kept focusing on the loving kindness. Now, I haven't gotten very far in this particular sutta, and we'll do the rest of it kind of fast. <laughs> okay, uh, okay, there were six. Then, uh, there are six principles of being cordial that create love and respect and conduce to cohesion and non-dispute, to concord and to unity. I've already talked about the three. The next one is a monk uses things in common with his virtuous companions in the holy life. 
without making reservations. He shares with them any, any kind of gain of any kind that accords with the Dhamma and has been obtained in a way that accords with the Dhamma, including even the mere contents of his alms book. Now there's a kind of practice that monks can do. It takes 12 years. It takes the practice of doing it every day for 12 years. And this is a practice of generosity. No, we, the monks don't handle food, or they don't handle money. So the kind of generosity that we practice, or can practice, is I go to a monastery and I tell the head monk and all of the other monks that I want to practice this kind of generosity. And that is, I will go out on alms round, and when I come back, I give whatever food's in the bowl to the head monk, he takes what he wants, I go to the next monk, he takes what he wants, I go to the next monk, he takes what he wants. If I run out of food, I go back on alms round and gather the food, and then I go to the head monk and see what he wants there, and the next monk, and the next monk, and I wind up feeding everybody in the monastery before I take food for myself. Now the trick is, you practice this kind of generosity, but you can't have one thought moment of remorse for giving food. There's sometimes that there's monks that come through that they might not be such good monks. And it, it's a real easy practice to, to give them the food and then walk away going, that guy's really a turkey, why did I give him that food? You can't have one thought like that for 12 years. After 12 years, any place to say, I did that for 12 years. I've never done it. It's, it's a really hard practice. Staying in one place for 12 years is an amazing, <laughs> amazingly hard thing to do for me because I move a lot. But after, after 12 years, anywhere I would go, when it was time for me to eat, there would be food in my bowl. I could be in the middle of the ocean on a boat and nobody else around. When it was time for me to eat, there would be food in the bowl. That's the advantage of doing this kind of practice practicing your generosity to such a fine degree, but it's not just the generosity, it's the mental discipline of watching your mind so that there's no remorse coming into your mind for 12 years. That's a wholesome mind. That's really, it's, it's nice to be around people like that. And that's the way it is in Asia. Not, not every place. There's, sometimes there's just one monk in a particular place that has done a practice that's really amazing. You know, they might practice loving kindness for the last 50 years. <laughs> and you walk into the room with them and you're like, oh man, it's like getting knocked over with this. And he's, he's not even like, paying attention to you. He's fiddling around here and doing this over here. You just walk into the room with him and it's, it's like overwhelming. And you're smiling and you're giggling and you're kind of chuckling to yourself because it feels so good. I've had the opportunity to be around people like that. It's really fun. So the more you can keep your practice of generosity going and sharing, the easier your mental discipline is, the easier everything is. Now, there are certain rules that monks can follow. They're called uh, Dutanga rules, and they're, they're kind of uh, disciplines that are a little bit above and beyond what other monks might be doing. And one of those rules is that you never eat food 
that's not in your bowl. It has to be offered. Somebody has to put it in your bowl for you, or you don't eat. And I've been with monks that have been like that for well, years and years. I have no idea. I think they've been practicing since they became full monks. And they were in their, their 60s anyway, so they've been doing it for 40 years, however long. And when you sit down and you start eating with these monks, you feel like sharing with them. So you have a nice little tidbit, put it in the bowl, and you share that way. And it's real fun. It's really nice. When I went to Australia, I uh, I went straight from Malaysia, and it was the shortest day of the year when I got to Australia. It was starting to get cold, and I wasn't prepared for cold at all. I mean, I I had my robes, I had uh, no socks, I had no no warm clothes at all. So I'm going to visit one of my friends, and I'm, as I'm going there, I'm starting to think, boy, it, it, the, my toes are really cold. You know, there's almost no feeling in them. It was that cold. It'd really be nice if I could get a pair of socks. And I went to see him, and then I went to a monastery where I was going to stay. And when I went to the monastery, I walked in, somebody came in with all kinds of socks. And they were distributing them to the monks. So I got a pair of socks, and I said, this is great stuff. And the next week I had a dozen pair of socks. And I'm starting to walk around going, I don't need any more. <laughs> but the thing is, a lot of things are given to me, a lot, and I accept everything. Whatever you want to give, I'll accept it, and then I get to give it away. I get to give it to somebody else. Uh, at, certain, at some monasteries, at the end of the range retreat, there's a special kind of ceremony, it's called the Katina Ceremony, where people come and they, they donate all kinds of things for monks that are going to be going, leaving that monastery and going other places around. And the, the, one of the big things that's offered is robes. I was at a monastery and I had a hundred robes given to me in one day. Oh my God, what am I going to do with a hundred robes? So I got one of my friends, they said, do you know where there's a poor monastery where they don't have many robes? He said, yeah, I know a couple of them. I said, good, have a hundred. <laughs> But that's the way it is with monks. We share among ourselves a lot, but if there's no monks around, I wind up sharing with anybody that's around and give stuff away all the time. And it's really fun. I like that. One of the hardest things I had to learn was to accept. You know, I don't need any more things. No, you can't do that. Anytime somebody wants to give something, I have to accept it. What I do with it after you give it is, is for me. And I wind up giving away this, giving away that. Oh, you need some of these? I got some of those. So it, it's kind of a fun practice. The next part of this sutta is talking about developing your virtue, developing your um, keeping your precepts as closely as you possibly can. There's all kinds of advantages of doing that. You have an uplifted mind. You become much more 
mindful of what you're going to do before you do it. So keeping, keeping the precepts is a very important part of the practice. I had one student that she would not break any precepts for any reason. And she was like that her whole life as far as I know. And she was always helping people do this and helping people do that. She was really a wonderful person. She wanted to learn how to meditate. I said, fine. Come to the retreat, I'll teach you how to meditate. Now this is a person that had never done any meditation in her whole life. She was almost 50. So she comes and I give her the instructions in the morning and in the afternoon I walk around and I say, well, how's it going? And she said, it's okay. I'm starting to get the hang of it. How long are you sitting? Oh, I can only sit for 45 minutes. Only, that's the key. <laughs> so I said, well, why don't you sit longer? She said, you know, I'm not used to sitting on the floor and my knees are just killing me at 45 minutes. I can't stand it anymore. I have to get up and walk. So I said, well, okay, why don't you sit in a chair instead? Her next sitting was four hours. She got into the first jhana, the first day she ever tried to meditate. She's amazing. And on the second day she comes back and she said, you know, this meditation, it works pretty good. I think I'll keep doing it. <laughs> <laughs> Her progress in the meditation was phenomenal. It didn't take her very long to get to the end result. The last thing that the Buddha was talking about was developing your wisdom. Developing your wisdom in Buddhism always means seeing how the process of dependent origination works. I've been telling you about dependent origination for quite a while. You have a feeling come up, and right after that, there's tension and tightness, that's craving. Right after that, there's your thoughts about and your concepts and opinions and all of those things. And your habitual tendency. This is a part of dependent origination. As you become more familiar with that, you start letting it go and you start seeing more and more little parts of the dependent origination. There's 12 different links, but there's no sense in going through them right now. So developing your wisdom means developing, seeing how the process of mind's attention actually works. And seeing this as an impersonal process. It's just a cause and effect relationship. <laughs> Everything. So when you develop doing, uh, practicing, and seeing dependent origination more and more clearly, you develop more and more balance in your mind and in your practice and in your life. So the things that used to get you really upset, now they barely even bother you. It's just like, okay, now let's work with this one. It's not such a big deal. So that's what this sutta is all about. It's about learning how to lovingly accept whatever arises and keep your mind focused on love and kindness. Learning how to develop your compassion. And an awful lot of people, they, they think compassion is taking another person's pain away from them, and it's not. Compassion is seeing another person in pain, allowing them to have their pain, and then focus on the solution. Love them no matter what. That's what compassion really is. 
I've read so many articles since I've been back in different magazines about how people try to cat, uh, how they try to develop their compassion with working with hospice and working with all these people that are ill and all of that, and everybody burns out. The only reason they burn out is because they don't really practice compassion. They're doing things with an attachment. They're not allowing the space for the other person to be the way they are and make it okay and love them no matter what. When you do that, you take off that myopic vision and that gives that other person space to change. Okay, so anybody have any questions? Got into a lot of stories today. Mm -hmm. It doesn't need to get her in your background. Well, I want to, I need to know what the precepts again. This is my last day here. Well, we'll give you a copy. Okay. And since I've killed a number of moths in my kitchen, you know, I guess I... See the one window? So I know, I've been window. watching it, yeah. I am... Uh, these are little little guys that get into my grains. Foods, yeah. So now I feel like I need to go to Pike Market and buy some crabs and let them go at the wharf. Good. That's a great thing to do. It's yeah, fine. I tell my husband it's though because really the crabs are expensive and if I let them go, they will get mad. <laughs> you will notice fun. the difference though. You will notice the difference. You'll feel a relief that you didn't think you saw. I didn't even know, know that I had that evidence. I have a real affinity for animals and creatures anyway. And um, I feel an awful lot, and I've spent my whole life reading about animals and how, and about their feelings. Mm -hmm. Elephants weep oh, about sure. how they, they care for their elderly and when someone's died. and just, uh, just a lot of things. So I have a real affinity for animals. Anyway, yeah. I've been ushering spiders out of my house for a very long time and stuff, but these little moths, it's just so easy to go. <laughs> it's easy to do that with mosquitoes, too. Yeah. But it's not such a good thing. Uh, no. <laughs> Actually, I haven't had any mosquito problems since ages. That's right. If, if, you don't, if you don't kill mosquitoes. I had a place where I was building all kinds of things and I had to take down this one structure and as soon as they started pulling it down there must have been oh, 75 anyway black widows Ooh. and I saw them I kept opening up not hurting any of the black widows but just making it light and then I walked away for 15 minutes I gave them a chance to go someplace else and they don't like being in the light, so they did. So I didn't have to kill any of them. And I told my aunt that, and she said, why didn't you kill them? And I said, I didn't need to. She said, I said, if I, if I kill black widows, they're going to tell their friends, and they're going to come and start biting on me, and I don't want that to happen. And she said, a dead black widow doesn't talk. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, <laughs> right before you squish him, he does. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I get stung very, very little with wasp or spiders or anything like that. Very little. Because I refuse to kill them. If you hire somebody to come to your house and kill wasps, are you? There's other innocent. ways of getting rid of wasps. Well, they moved into they moved into our wall. This yeah, I know. Before I, I know all about in, them. And they were coming into the house. They broke through the wallpaper because they mushed it all up inside. I saw this little wasp butt. You know, I went and I this noise. And I saw this little spot. I said, "What is that?" And it was a little wasp butt sticking out of the hole, and it went 
ink like that to make it go back inside. And all I did was crack off the plaster about this big around. So the then they really came coming. in. They're yellow yeah. jackets. Anyway, yeah. he had a guy come and spray. But you can make it uncomfortable for them and they will leave. And cayenne pepper is really wonderful stuff for that. You spray cayenne pepper, they gotta go. Oh. They will leave. Okay. Yeah. Huh. How do you spray cayenne pepper? Mix it with water. You just put it in a mister? Yeah. Yeah. Creative solutions from Buddhists. Yeah, you because get, you there get aren't cockroaches too many people and around. don't want any cockroaches in your house. You take a cucumber and you cut it up real fine, you put it in a bowl of where they where they go and they will leave. They won't be around anymore. They don't mm. like the smell of that. Mm. <laughs> what do you do for the little moths? I have to put all my grains in the freezer. Mm. Well you gotta get different kind of containers for your for your Do you have grains. open packages? No, put them in jars with, you know, a gasket and a clamp sometimes, down. Sometimes, sometimes, like when it happened to me, I found um, a small box of granola that was in the back of the closet, yeah. and they had gotten in that's what they had put laid all the things in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then another time there was, it's usually like a leftover mm -hmm. cereal box. Yeah, yeah we, I've got cereal in another cupboard. Mm -hmm. Have you found the, where are they? Yeah, you got to find the source. No, because they, they you got to take everything out of the cabinet, come from all and over, clean it all out, and then go through each mm -hmm. of the boxes and container. <laughs> You've done it too, haven't mm -hmm. you, Katie? You have to go through everything and check and see if they're in there. And they make this spider webby stuff. Mm -hmm. in the yeah, food. looks like a little cocoon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it's like spider webby stuff all over the food. Oh you know? yeah, but yeah, you can see that. Yeah, it's you'll kind find of clumps of it in mm -hmm. Yeah. So then, what do you do? You throw mm -hmm. it out <laughs> and get rid of that and take it outside and throw it out and clean all your cabinets and disinfect and start all over again. And throw it out, mm -hmm. isn't that killing them and disinfecting no. by taking it out and throw it in the woods? It's not killing them, it's letting them go out to where they can finish eating and live quite nicely. Mm. But what you want to do is, is put some cayenne pepper in your water and wash the inside. The inside. The walls, the underneath the shelves, the tops of the shelves. They'll leave you alone. Oh, well, that worked for other moths, too. <laughs> they have clothes moths we brought from Pittsburgh. You, you got to find, okay, your, your nest is inside, it's between two things that are hanging someplace in the zipped up bags or whatever. It's turning into a Buddhist nature program. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a, anyway. that's a wall. I brought them from that to Jesus to Virginia. Same thing. May suffering ones be suffering free, and the fear struck fear us be. May the grieving shed all grief, and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth Devas and Nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Here, student, some man or woman is obstinate arrogant, does not pay homage to one who should receive homage, does not rise up for one whose presence he should rise up, does not offer a seat to one who deserves a seat, does not make a way for one for whom he should make way, and does not honor, respect, revere, and venerate one who should be honored, respected, revered, and venerated because of performing and, and undertaking such action he reappears in a state of deprivation but if instead he comes back to the human state then wherever he is reborn he is low born 
that is the way that leads to low birth. Namely, one is obstinate and arrogant and does not honor, respect, revere, and venerate one who should be honored, respected, revered, and venerated. But here, some man or woman is not obstinate and arrogant. He pays homage to one who should receive homage, rises up for one in whose presence he should rise up, offers a seat to one who deserves a seat, takes way for, makes way for one whom he should make way, honors, respects, revenerate, venerates, and reveres one who should be honored, respected, revered, and venerated. Because of performing and undertaking such action, he reappears in a happy destination. But if, instead, he comes back to the human state, then wherever he is reborn, he is high-born. Born into a, a wealthy family, an influential family, a family that is a Buddhist family. A low-born is someone that's, that's born in a very poor situation, and they always stay in that poor situation. And uh, their family doesn't have any influence with other people, things like that. Here, student, some man or woman does not visit a recluse or a Brahmin and ask, Venerable Sir, what is wholesome? what is unwholesome, what is blamable, what is blameless, what should be cultivated, what should not be cultivated, what kind of action will lead to harm and suffering for a long time, what kind of action will lead to my welfare and happiness for a long time. Because of performing and undertaking such action, he reappears in a state of deprivation. But if instead he comes back to the human state, then when wherever he is reborn, he is stupid. Now, when I was in Asia, the Chinese will not ask questions. They have many questions, but they will never ask a question. So I told them <coughs> that if you do not ask me questions when I ask you to ask me questions, then you will be reborn stupid. <laughs> and all of a sudden, hands started coming up. <laughs> Nobody wants to be reborn stupid. <laughs> Is that because of their culture? Okay. Yeah. yeah. The, their culture is such that uh, they... Uh, the teacher, whatever he says, is always right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you never ask a question because the teacher might not know the answer. Mm -hmm. But I am not Chinese. <laughs> <laughs> and I ask many, many, many questions when I first became a Buddhist. So much so, I, I lived with a monk, very, very scholar monk, very intelligent, always asking questions, 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 questions. And he said, when you die from this world and you're reborn, you are going to be reborn smarter than Einstein. Because <laughs> I asked well, so many questions. But I also encourage everyone to ask me questions. And if I do not know the answer, I will tell you I don't know the answer, but I will try to find out the answer. So that way we can both gain benefit. Because I, I certainly, I do not know everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What do you think of Thich Nhat Hanh's teaching? I don't know a lot about his teaching. Mm -hmm. But when I was in Malaysia, I started teaching everyone to smile. And he came to Malaysia and all of a sudden, 
he was teaching everyone to smile. Yes. And I thought that that was very wonderful. It doesn't matter where you get the idea from. What matters is that you teach other people to smile and have uplifted mind and everyone benefits. And it made me very happy. But I've never spent any time with him. I, I, I honestly, I don't know. Um, next March, I'm going to be going to Germany. And with any luck at all, I'll be able to visit France and visit Plum Village, where he is. Oh, when is this going to happen? March. March. Okay. That's when the invitation is talked about right now. That's what they're talking about, March. <coughs> they come to California every other year. Every year? Every other year. I have oh, he comes to California every other year. Yeah. I know that he has a temple or he has a, there's yeah, a meditation yeah, center that's very close to where my mother lives. Oh, is that in San, uh, San, Diego? San Diego? Yeah, and Valley Center. That's very close to Escondido, and Escondido is where I grew up. Oh. My brother lived there. Oh? My brother lived there. When I moved there, there was 12,000 people. Now there's a, over 120,000 people. I don't even know how to get around in the town anymore. <laughs> so why did you move to Missouri? I wanted to be in the middle of the country. There's a big center on the west coast. There's a big center on the east coast. There's nothing in the middle. I want to be in the middle. I want to follow the middle way. <laughs> <laughs> That's the choice. Yeah. You're on the center of most. <laughs> and also, I, I truly love the Ozarks. The Ozark Mountains are very, very beautiful, and the rocks are special there. Mm -hmm. they, they, they make you feel good. Can I ask a personal question? Yes. Yeah. Do your family follow your teaching? No, they don't. I'm the youngest one of all my brothers and sister, and they think of me as being this tall. <laughs> and I don't, I don't push anything on them. I, I tell them that I teach meditation. If they want to ask, then I'll talk with them, but they haven't wanted to ask. Since they asked a question, I want to ask them. My husband is um, a Christian, uh -huh. and uh, he's Caucasian, and he's Christian, and I, I, I was born and raised uh, Buddhism in Vietnam, so when I came to this country in 1980, and I married him, we married in 1985, and I became Christian since then, and it's just about, it, it, just recently, a year ago, I said to the, you know, a friend, just, uh -huh. just um, kind of talk me back, and, and I attend some of the Buddhist teaching, and I just go back. It's just, it's just the, 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 it bring back memory and conscious mind, and it's all bring me back to, this is the right way I'm being raised, and this is who I am. Yeah. And I talked to my husband, he's very supportive of that. Very good. And um, you know, he, he yeah, he, he just do whatever he's doing and he doesn't mind I'm going to Buddhist teaching and I think he can see some change in, in me. But I my son I have three boys and who's still Christian and the three of them have been baptized at that at some point. And I, I you know, I, I hope that in time I can bring the Buddhist teaching back to home, my my family. And well, you know, the thing yes. with the Buddhist teaching that is so different is it does not fight with other religion. Yeah. In Christianity, you have belief. Mm -hmm. You have to believe in Jesus Christ and all of this yeah. other thing. Yeah. But with Buddhism, it's not about belief. It's about how mind works. Yeah. So it's a little bit different than, than uh, and it's not, 
that does not fight with Christianity. But will I? I, be, I keep praying every night when I um, pray that. Well, when you're practicing loving kindness, what do you think you're doing? But I think at this point I'm just doing for a spiritual friend, not for my Well, but that's okay for right now. As your mind goes deeper into your meditation, you will get to a place where I will come and tell you, now I want you to do family members. And then you can start sending loving kindness to your husband and your sons and all of that. Yeah, I, I but this doesn't mean that you can't, during the day, think loving and kind thoughts to them. Mm -hmm. You can. Mm -hmm. It's just when you sit, when you're doing your, your quiet meditation, you use your spiritual friend. Mm -hmm. But during the day, if you have a thought of them, then smile and Send that smile to them. Feel that in your heart. I do, I do. I thought about that, but I just kind of have to get my thought back into my spiritual friend. Yeah. And the, the, well, the but that's system. just that's just for sitting. Yeah. The rest of the day you can do whatever, yeah. to whoever you want. Okay? Thank you. Okay. Here, student, some man or woman visits a recluse in Brahmins and asks what is wholesome, what kind of action will lead to my welfare and happiness for a long time. Because of performing and undertaking such action, he reappears in a happy destination. But if instead he comes back to the human state, then wherever he is reborn, he is wise. See, that's what my teacher was telling me. I'm going to be the wisest man in the world. Because <laughs> I ask so many questions. And I have students that are going to be very, very, very wise. <laughs> <laughs> As a matter of fact, one student I told them that on their gravestone after they die, I'm going to put, I have a question, can I ask you? <laughs> <laughs> Thus, students, the way that leads to short life makes people short-lived. The way that leads to long life makes people long-lived. The way that leads to sickliness makes people sickly. The way that leads to health makes people healthy. The way that leads to ugliness makes people ugly. The way that leads to beauty makes people beautiful. The way that leads to being uninfluential makes people uninfluential. The way that leads to being influential makes people influential. The way that leads to poverty makes people poor. The way that leads to wealth makes people wealthy. The way that leads to low birth makes people low born. The way that leads to high birth makes people high born. The way that leads to stupidity makes people stupid. The way that leads to wisdom makes people wise. Beings are owners of their actions, heirs of their actions. They originate from their actions, are bound to their actions, have their actions as their refuge. It is action that distinguishes beings as inferior or superior. When that was said, the Brahmin student Sabha, Todiya's son, said to the Blessed One, Magnificent Master Gotama, magnificent. Master Gotama has made the Dhamma clear in many ways, as though he were turning upright what was overturned, revealing what was hidden, showing the way to one who was lost or holding up a lamp in the dark for those with eyesight to see forms. 
I go to Master Gotama for refuge and to the Dhamma and the Sangha. When Mas let Master Gotama remember me as a lay follower who has gone for, to him for refuge for life. Now this was a very big statement because Sabha was a very much a scholar Brahmin. He had memorized all of the Vedas and because of this clear explanation he stopped being a Brahmin and became a Buddhist. Okay. Any other questions? <laughs> so what's the difference between a Brahmin and a Buddhist? The Brahmins follow the Vedas. Right. Basically, they teach one-pointed concentration and they teach reincarnation. They have permanent self permanent soul going from one lifetime to the next, to the next, to the next. Well, after their death, they go back to be... The same people. person, the same soul goes back and does it all over again. You know, that's what their belief is. But in Buddhism, we believe in rebirth. But rebirth is... Uh, do you remember what happened yesterday? That's when you were, it, it's gone, it's not here now. What happened yesterday is dead. Mm -hmm. What happens right now is in the present moment. Mm -hmm. But that will die and then a new present moment will be reborn. Everything that arises is part of an impersonal process. With the meditation, you will be able to see that more and more clearly as you go deeper into the meditation. You'll see it much more, more, uh, much better. And you say, you're sitting and all of a sudden pain arises. Whose pain is that? Who said, I haven't felt pain for a long time. I want pain to arise right here. No. That doesn't work that way. You can't control the pain. The pain arises because conditions are right mm -hmm. for pain to be there. As you let go and relax, that pain will either go away or it won't. But if it doesn't go away after you keep allowing it to be, your mind will become so balanced that it doesn't even go to that. And you will see that this is an impersonal process. It's not a personal process. And that's the, one of the main differences between the Brahmins and the Buddhists. Mm -hmm. Right now it will sound like a lot of words. But as you practice the meditation more, it will become more clear, and you will understand it. So just be patient. I'm just saying, because this is the first time I heard that Buddhism is not based on reincarnation, because you know all the things that we've been read, read about, or you know, or, or, or explained in the different Buddhist talk is based on real. Reincarnation. Yeah, but it's not reincarnation because that means that there is a permanent self or soul that goes from one lifetime to the next lifetime to the next lifetime, and it doesn't work like that. Okay. And you will be able to see that when you get deep enough in your meditation. It goes out of the realm of philosophy and it comes into the realm of reality. You see things arise and pass away, arise and pass away. There's a continuum that happens, but it's not a personal continuum. I want to share some of my mom personal experience. A long time ago, she don't do that anymore. She did meditation where she went really deep. Uh -huh. She was able to see past, past life yeah. of family and herself uh -huh. and my dad. It's and she told us about it. Uh -huh. Is that possible? Yes. Mm -hmm. 
Do you remember what happened yesterday? I went to work. Okay. <laughs> yeah. That's a past life, isn't it? Yeah. Learning how to develop your memory. You will be able, you can go deeper and deeper and you can get into past life. And then she got scared because she, she saw herself, she saw her spirit lift off of her body when she was sitting. That's why she needed to be around a teacher. She didn't need to be scared of something like that. These kind of things can are very easy to explain. Yeah. I don't know how can one do that, but... Well, that's, I know how what, she's, what she was experiencing, and it's nothing to be afraid of. Yeah. See, that's the advantage of being around a teacher instead of just doing the practice on your own. Do you ever try to heal people in the hospital with your... I heal people all the time. Can, they, can you share some of that experience with them? <laughs> some people that I work with and I teach them how to practice metta, loving-kindness. They might die, but they are healed when they die. It doesn't necessarily mean that uh, the things that I teach is going to make their body healthy again, but their mind and their understanding becomes more and more healthy. So I'm always, I'm always in the process of healing and showing other people how to heal themselves. There was one man, he was an airline pilot. He, he flew 747s all over the world. And he got cancer. And he came and he started practicing meditation with me. I didn't know he had cancer until he told me. He had to go into the hospital. This was the last time he was going into the hospital. The cancer was really bad. He asked me what he should do so that he could die with a very happy, uplifted mind. And I told him that if there was anyone that he knew that he caused pain for them, he should see them and ask them to forgive him. And he should, anyone that caused him pain, he should tell them that he forgives them. And he did that. His face became so, so beautiful when he did that. All of the fear disappeared. I had to go teach a meditation retreat in Thailand, so I could only be there for a short period of time. Right before I left, he told me, he, I came into the room and he told me, or he told everyone, everyone out of the room, I have to talk to Reverend, just, I have to talk to him alone. So I said, okay, what's happening? And he said, the doctor just came and told me today that I should make out my will because I'm terminal. And I laughed. And I said, we're all terminal. And it's okay to be terminal. And then he started to see that this was funny. Why am I worrying about being terminal? I have an idea when I'm going to die. That's an advantage. Now I can really do some work. But when we're up walking around and we think we're all healthy, we say, well, I can put off this work till later. So now he, put a, he can do the work. He got a picture of his spiritual friend and he put it in his room. And he spent a lot of time sending loving and kind thoughts to his spiritual friend. day before I got back to Malaysia, he had died. 
and I was sorry that I didn't get to see him again. But the people that were in the room with him, his body had turned just to skeleton. It, it, it just skin hanging off of bone. He only weighed 65 pounds or something like that. He was nothing left of his body. But he was very aware on the day that he died and he started telling people how much he appreciated them and he started wishing them all happiness and saying goodbye. And then he felt death coming very close and he had someone turn him over on his side so he could look at the picture. And he started smiling and he died that way. That was a healing. That was an absolutely brilliant way to die. And he died with a happy mind. He wasn't afraid. He wasn't angry. He didn't have anything to hold on to. He just breathed, breathed, breathed his last breath and happily let go. That was one of the best healings I've ever heard of. And there have been times that there's been some real amazing things happen when I've been in the hospital visiting people. This one man, he had a, a tumor that was around his carotid artery and he had to have an operation. This is a very serious operation. He was supposed to be in the operating room for about five hours. He was in the operating room for 11 hours. Before he went into the hospital, I had he and his family come to see me. And we started sending loving kindness to him. I started sending loving kindness to the doctors, to the nurses, everybody in the hospital that would have anything to do with him sent loving kindness to all of the family members and then he went in the hospital. So that whole day I was sending loving and kind thoughts to his doctors and the nurses and to him. The next day after he got out of the surgery they put him on complete life support. They didn't want him to be moving around at all. So I didn't get a chance to see him. The day after that, his family members came and said, now he's in a, in a room. But this was in a big dormitory. There must have been 50 or 60 people in this room. And all of them were sick, and there he was. He was with them. And as soon as I came, he started smiling. And I held his hand. And I was sending loving and kind thoughts to him. And after about an hour, I started noticing that he's getting stronger. And stronger. And before long, he's sitting up <laughs> and asking for something to drink. So uh, that's uh, one of the, another kind of amazing thing that I saw happen, but it wasn't me that did anything. It wasn't me, it was the love that I had for him. You had a miracle with him? It was a miracle, it was. He was out of the hospital in three days after having had a lo an 11 hour surgery. And he was a school teacher and his voice was very important to him. But after he got out of the, the hospital, he could barely talk. And he asked me what he should do. And I said, you just start focusing on loving kindness, that's all. You don't need any more than that. And he would get up every morning. He had a, a very long, a big yard. And he would walk back and forth while he was doing his loving kindness. And then he would sit under a tree and do his loving kindness. And then he would get up and walk again. And he would eat and do all this other stuff. 
and I was going to be giving a, a class and he wanted to come to the class. So he came to the class and while we were sitting loving and doing loving kindness, he had a feeling that something was happening in his throat and he started talking again in a regular voice. Master, uh, do you feel maybe uh, some of your life in the, uh, the past, previous life, you've been a monk somewhere around the East? Yes. I've been a teacher for a long, long time. A thousand years maybe? I don't know if it's that long, but it's been a long time. I, used, I was a teacher at universities, I was a teacher as a monk. I have many students that I teach, they remember past lifetimes and they remember me in uh, many different lifetimes. Do you have any Tibet yet? No. And about the study of the Vichy uh, system? Uh, no. I've never studied any mysticism. What I, what I study is just what the Buddha said. Yeah. Yeah. I ever heard you talking today about um, people that practice Reiki? Yeah. And how it could sort of um, slow down the, pro the progress of a person. Yeah. And I was just thinking about when I practice Reiki, I'm not really practicing Reiki. You're practicing metta. Yeah. <laughs> I, I wouldn't. I mean, I learned the symbols. Yeah. But they're not very beneficial because it's just a one point of concentration. Yeah. So I just practice metta. Yeah. And it's very effective. Yeah. And so, I mean, I guess whoever you know, the person you're talking about, that's kind of what I would say to yeah. that person. Like, do what you're doing. Just. Just add this few extra steps. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. yeah. I wasn't sure if you knew but what it was. But who I was talking about was somebody that was very attached to being a Reiki master. Um. And that's when you get to a certain level in your meditation, you have to make a choice. Either you're going to go to the Reiki and do the Reiki and let go of the meditation. So are they attached to the symbols? Yes. Oh, you know, it's been an honor to meet you. Oh, <laughs> shucks. <laughs> <laughs> it's been an honor to meet you, too. Thank you. I okay. must have done something good. Good karma. Good, good karma. karma. Thank Me, you. too. <laughs> okay, let's share some there. Right? May suffering ones be suffering free, and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief, and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power, share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. With your metta class, one of the things that we used to do in Malaysia was we would ask anyone in the, that came to the class if they knew of anyone that was suffering in some way or another, and if they could bring a photograph of them, and then get everybody to look at them, and then visualize that person being right in the middle of the room, and everyone radiating metta to them at the same time. And for how long? Oh, ten minutes. Mm -hmm. Perfect. It's, it's amazing. It's really amazing.